Hi, thanks for joining us today. If this ministry has impacted your life, we want to hear about it. You can send us your story at amen at vnchurch.com. Also, we would love if you would partner with us financially. You can go to vnchurch.com and click the Give Online or text your donation amount to 757-230-2110. To honor copyright laws, we have removed some audio and video elements from this message. Now here's this week's message. Welcome to Vineyard Community Church. How's everyone doing? You're doing good today? Yeah. yeah. Well, I also want to welcome the people watching online. So glad you tune in, either in the comfort of your house or wherever you may be today. So glad you're uh, with us today. It's always an honor to speak with you guys. I'm so thankful for our senior pastors, Pastor Andy and Sharon Mead, for giving me this opportunity to hang out with you today, okay? So we have been in a church-wide series called Hello, Holy Spirit where we have been discovering the character of the Holy Spirit. Who is this Holy Spirit and how do we connect with it? Okay, so a lot of times, you know, when it comes to the Trinity, you know, you got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. See, and when it comes to the Trinity, sometimes like, yeah, God the Father is good. Woo. God the Son, Jesus, yeah, he, he gave his life, yeah. And, oh, yeah, that, that other one. <laughs> that Holy Ghost, Casper or something, whatever that is, you know. Yeah, it's like, well, what is the Holy Spirit? But we have discovered in this series in which, if you're new with us today, you can go on our website, vineyardchurch.com, and watch the previous weeks. What we have discovered is the Holy Spirit is vital for the life of a Jesus follower. It's vital for the life of a person. And because of the Holy Spirit, we can connect with God at any day and at any place. So if you are taking notes today, live tweet into at Vineyard VA using our hashtag Vineyard VA. Or if you're following along on your outline, you can title this speech, How Do I Experience, experience You Daily, Holy Spirit? How do I experience you daily? How do we experience the Holy Spirit in our everyday lives? Now, that's a good question. Now, there is something that I want to say to start off my message. I believe that Jesus provides the best life possible. I believe when we live for Jesus, he gives us the best life possible. I don't think Jesus came to give us an okay life, a decent life, a just getting by kind of life. But I believe a, a, a life with Jesus is the best life possible. I actually believe the best version of you is found in your relationship with Jesus. It's found in, in what God has for you. See, the problem is this, though. Oftentimes, we do believe in a God. And we will even sing songs to a Savior. But sometimes it gets hard to walk out that life every single day. Sometimes it gets hard to walk out what we know about God every day. Here comes the Holy Spirit. Here comes the job of the Holy Spirit. Now, if people treated the Holy Spirit like they do their smartphones... This world would be a lot better of a place, <laughs> and your life would be a lot better. See, I can't go anywhere without my iPhone. I take it every single place I go. I feel, like, weird sometimes if I don't have it. it, it now, it, and it's gotten so bad. Can I tell you how bad it's gotten? It's gotten so bad that I even have my phone on my wrist now. <laughs> I bought one of those Apple watches, man. So wherever I go, I got my phone with me. It's, here's one of the worst things that, that happened. Anytime Aaron and I, we go to the gym, if we're on our way and we recognize one of us didn't bring our Apple watches, we'll drive all the way back home and get our watch. Because the reason why is if you don't start your workout on your Apple watch, it feels like you never worked out. <laughs> like, I didn't work out today. My Apple watch didn't tell me I did. So, I mean, it's that bad. But imagine if people treated the Holy Spirit like that. Like, wherever I go, I got to bring the Holy Spirit with me. When I go to my job, I got to bring the Holy Spirit with me. When I go to school, I'm bringing the Holy Spirit with me. When I go to Walmart, I'm bringing the Holy Spirit with me. 
The truth is, though, if you're going to Walmart, you definitely need the Holy Spirit with you to go to that place. It's a weird place, man. Some weird things happen there. See, Jesus says this about the Holy Spirit in John 14. He says, but the advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things, and check out this, and remind you of everything I have said to you. I love how personal the Holy Spirit is described in the same verse in the message version of the Bible. It says it like this in the message, the friend. I love it. The Holy Spirit is the friend. The friend, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send at my request, will make everything plain to you. He will remind you of all things I have told you. I'm leaving you well and whole. That's my parting gift to you. Now, that's Jesus talking to us. That's Jesus speaking to us. The Holy Spirit has been given to us. So the question that comes, how do we experience the Holy Spirit daily? See, I believe the Holy Spirit does speak to us every day. We just have to listen. I actually like to put it like this. The Holy Spirit nudges us. The Holy Spirit taps us. It nudges us in our heart, nudges us in our mind, and our soul. It's that nudge that the Holy Spirit gives us. Now, I have a story about the nudge of the Holy Spirit in my life that, that just happened, okay? So Aaron and I went on a cruise this past spring for vacation, right? And so, and whenever we do a trip or wherever we go, normally the planning process is like Aaron picks everything and I just say, yes, babe. <laughs> that's, that's normally how it goes, okay? Which I'm okay with. So when we got to the Grand Cayman Islands, uh, one, one of the stops, Aaron planned a snorkeling expedition, right? Okay, so let me give you a little backstory. Last summer, I just learned how to swim, okay? So I got swim lessons last summer, right? Now, let me let you know where I'm at. I'm, I'm not Michael Phelps, okay? I'm at the level where I'll get into a pool now and be okay. Actually, I'm more like in the level I'm okay with taking a bath now. That's, <laughs> like, that's where I'm at, okay? I am not an expert swimmer by no means, all right? So she tells us this is where we're going. So in my head, I'm thinking, okay, well, she knows I'm not a good swimmer, so this must be like some pool where they like put a whole bunch of tropical fish in and you like just dip your head on her. It's like, wow, I found Dory, you know. <laughs> That's what I was expecting. So we get to the place. Nope, it's not that. All I see is the ocean and this, and this uh, dock in the middle of, of the ocean. And so I'm like, man, that must be for the experts because I know my loving and kind wife won't do this to me. <laughs> I know she wouldn't do that. And so we, we, get, we get to the place, we sit down, the instructor's telling us how to put on our headgear, the little fins that you have to put on, and all this stuff. And then the instructor says, all right, now all of us, we're going to jump into the water and swim to, the, to that dock in the middle of the, uh, the middle of the water. And as I'm sitting there, I looked at my wife, just really confused. And I, <laughs> and I said, is this why you got life insurance on me just recently? <laughs> Like, I didn't really understand. All of a sudden, you said, hey, we need life insurance. And I'm like, all right. So I, I didn't get it. And then she was like, you can swim. I was like, no, I can't. She's like, you took lessons. I said, barely. I barely took lessons. What are you talking about? She said, that little girl's doing it. I'm like, I was like, don't compare me to her. She's an expert at this. She's been swimming her whole life. I, mean, I, got my, I got my little fins on. I'm mad as can be right now. I can't believe this. Do you know how impossible it is to be mad at someone when you got those little water fins on? You just flopping around. It's like, the girl, you just wait till we get back to this boat. You won't hear about this. It's like impossible to be mad with some fins on. Try it. But she gets in, Aaron goes before me. She gets in the water. I start stepping down the stairs. Each, each step I'm going down, I'm like, man, I'm going to die today. This is not good. And so finally I get into the water, and everything my swim coach taught me, totally forgot about it. Didn't remember one thing. Instantly went back to the doggy paddle. Like, oh, mm, waves. Mm, mm, I can't do it. And I'm like, babe, go on without me. Go on. Get the fish, babe. Go. And she's like, okay. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, dang, she really did get this life insurance on me for a reason. It's messed up. So 
she goes on at me. I get back up. I climb back on, on the dock. I'm exhausted. I got my fins. I'm trying to walk. Then the instructor is like, is everything okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm okay. And I just said the first thing that popped in my head. I said, I said yeah, I'm okay. I'm just giving the fish a break. <laughs> they, they were tired. I'm giving the fish a break. And so I sat down on the dock, and I'm, I'm pretty dramatic of a person. <laughs> I don't know if you guys have recognized this yet, but uh, um, I was sitting down on the dock. I have my little pity party going on. I'm feeling all negative. I got all these negative thoughts in my head, like I'm a failure and all this stuff. And then, true story, I felt a nudge from the Holy Spirit. I really did. I felt a nudge from the Holy Spirit. And I felt like the Holy Spirit said, don't be afraid of the water. Face your fears and remember what you've learned. So at that moment, I was like, forget you, Holy Spirit. I'm going to sit here right now. <laughs> then I thought to myself, wow, we spent a lot of money on this trip. All right, I'll listen to you, Holy Spirit. And so I, and so I got up. I jumped in the water, and I began to remember what my swim coach taught me. Then Aaron came to me. She helped me get out there. And then I actually blew up my, my life jacket, like, to double, triple the size. I was like a little marshmallow, like, floating around <laughs> looking at fish. And we ended up having a great time, man. It was one of the, probably the highlights of our trip. See, but in that moment, I had a nudge from the Holy Spirit. God was speaking to me. But at the same time I had a nudge, I had to make a decision. See, the Holy Spirit will nudge on your heart. God will begin to point you in directions for your life. But we have to respond to the nudge of the Holy Spirit. In order to experience God, we have to obey God. We have to listen to God. And I think the Holy Spirit nudges us every day. We can either do life by ourselves or we can do life with God. See, which leads me to my tweetable thought today. Very simple today. Respond to the nudge of the Holy Spirit. Respond to the nudge of the Holy Spirit. See, I have, I have a, a story in the Bible I'm going to read about two disciples who had to respond to the nudge. And I have three responses to the nudge of the Holy Spirit. And I believe this is how we can experience the Holy Spirit daily. Take this out. Point one says this. Responding to the nudge will take an ordinary day and make it extraordinary. Responding to the nudge will take an ordinary day and make it extraordinary. See, God, God is in the business of the extraordinary. And as Jesus followers, we should expect the extraordinary in our lives. And if you're married in here today, you should expect an extraordinary marriage, not an ordinary one. If you have a family, you should expect God to do extraordinary things with your family, not ordinary. If you go into work, don't expect to have an ordinary work experience, but have an extraordinary one. Jesus came to bring us the best life possible. Jesus came to make us more, not less. And so I believe when we live for God, we should expect the extraordinary in our lives. Ordinary and Jesus, and they don't go together. See, but check this out. We see this in the first church in Acts 3, starting in verse 1. It says this, one day. It says one day. It was just a one day. It was just an ordinary day. It was just a normal day. It was going through the routine kind of day. One day, Peter and John were going up to the temple at the time of prayer, and it was about 3 in the afternoon. It was just one day, the Bible says. And one day is an ordinary day. It's a normal day. But on this one day, God was ready to do something extraordinary. See, Peter and John just received the power of the Holy Spirit, and now they're going to the temple to pray. There are three times that there are three times of prayer that the people would go to morning, noon, and at night. Now check this out. The story continues. It says, now a man who was lame from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he was put every day to beg from those going into the temple courts. So this man, who is believed to be around the age of 40, sat at the gate and begged. The gate called Beautiful. And he was sent there morning, noon, and night during the times of prayer. And the reason why he would do this is because Jewish people in that culture believed that when you gave money to the poor, it puts you in better standing with God. So they didn't give to the poor be out of a love for God and his people. They gave to God because they thought they could manipulate God's love. They gave out of selfish reasons. But this beggar, he knew that. 
And during the time of prayer, he would make his money. This was his ordinary routine. This was his normal routine. And the ordinary routine of the godly people went to give to these people. But the Bible says that one day, on this ordinary day, Peter and John were heading up to the temple courts. The story continues. It says, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for money. Peter looked straight at him, as did John. Then Peter said, look at us. So the man gave, him, gave them his attention, expecting to get something from them. He was expecting something. The crippled man was expecting to get what he normally got. He was expecting to get some loose change. He was expecting the ordinary. And sometimes when we read over scriptures, we can forget the humanity of the people that the stories are talking about. See, these biblical stories, they're real documentations of, of normal people. The Bible is not a book that just fell out of the heavens and someone happened to stumble upon it. It's a book filled with stories about ordinary people. Come on. It's a book filled with stories about ordinary people that had ordinary fears, that had ordinary insecurities just like you and me, that had ordinary disbeliefs at times, that had ordinary problems. The man asks for money. Peter looks at him. John looks at him. And then they get this nudge from above. They get this nudge from the Holy Spirit, and they have a decision to make. Respond to the nudge, and something extraordinary will happen, or don't respond to the nudge and go through the ordinary routine. Then Peter said, silver or gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. See, see, that's a powerful story, right? But I don't read this story like everyone else reads this story. I read this story a little different than how most people read it. See, I, I don't think Peter was that confident when he was talking to the man. See, a lot of times people, they read the story kind of like this. Silver or gold, come on. I do not have, but what I do have, in the name of Jesus, Christ of Nazareth, full name. walk like this like real like strong and courageous and bold way to say it right see the reason why i don't read it like that because when i read about peter in the bible and just a few months before this story peter was the dude who ran away from everybody when he confronted by a 12 year old girl that if he knew jesus peter lied and said he didn't know him peter was not that confident of a guy Peter was not a very courageous man. Peter was not very brave. See, we got to stop reading the Bible like it's a book filled with a bunch of superhuman people doing extraordinary things. It's the complete opposite of that. Throughout the 66 books of the Bible, it's filled with stories of mess ups, people who weren't good enough, the misfits, the JV team. It's filled with stories of normal, everyday people who just decide to make a decision to stand up and say, I don't got it all figured out, but I believe my God is going to work in me and through me and for me, and God can take my normal life and make it extraordinary see when I read the story I read a little bit more like this um shoot um silver or gold I don't have that because you know, I get paid every two weeks so <laughs> I don't have that right now on me it'd be tight if I gave you something Silver or gold I don't have, but what I do have, um, uh, in the name of Jesus, the Christ of Nazareth, the whole name, walk. And check out what happens next. Taking him by the right hand, he helped him up and instantly, instantly, I love that word. Instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. He jumped to his feet and began to walk. He went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping 
and praising God. I love it. See, here's what I want you to get, though. Here's the best part. It was just a one day. It was just an ordinary day. It was just a normal day. And you're telling me, Pastor Jacob, in my normal, everyday, one day lives that God can do something extraordinary in my ordinary life? Heck yeah, he can. Because we got the power of the Holy Spirit in us. See, one day can become the day that God moves in your life. One day can be the day that you move closer to the purpose God has for you. One day can be the day that God takes the crippling situations in your life and restores life back to it. One day can be an extraordinary day when you respond to the nudge. Point one, one day. Point one, I'm sorry. Responding to the nudge will take an ordinary day and make it extraordinary. Point two, responding to the nudge will give you confidence that God can do it again. That God will do it again. Do it again? Do what again, Pastor Jacob? I'm glad you asked me. I'm about to tell you. See, the Holy Spirit will give you confidence that if God did it once before, I mean, he's faithful to do it again. He's faithful to move again. The Holy Spirit was nudging them to do something extraordinary. But I wonder why Peter moved in this direction. Why would he think to ask this crippled man to walk, to stand up? Now, the verse I read earlier when Jesus was telling us about the Holy Spirit, Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will remind you of everything I have said to you. When Peter and John are looking at this crippled man sitting at the gate, it would have reminded them of an event that they experienced when they were walking with Jesus. In the Gospel of Mark, which was written by the Apostle Peter, there's a story of a blind beggar named Bartimaeus. Jesus was walking with his 12 disciples, Peter and John being among the, the group. There's a crowd of people some people say thousands of people were surrounding Jesus at this point in his ministry, then the Bible says that blind Bartimaeus was sitting in the street corner, begging in his ordinary spot. Sounds familiar, right? He's doing his ordinary thing, and he hears that Jesus is walking by, and then Bartimaeus cries out to Jesus with this interesting phrase. He says, Son of David. Have mercy on me. Now, the phrase son of David was more than just a genealogy statement. It was a statement that the Jewish people would say about the coming Messiah, that the son of David was to come. When people referred to Jesus as the son of David, they meant that he was the long-awaited deliverer and fulfillment of the Old Testament prophecies. See, Bartimaeus made this connection about Jesus. This guy this guy is my savior. But check out the funny part that happened. Bartimaeus cries out, son of David, have mercy on us. And then the Bible says the disciples try to shut him up. Try to tell him to be quiet. And just when you read about Peter and knowing the character of Peter, I wouldn't be surprised if Peter was one of the people that was trying to tell him to shut up the most. But then Bartimaeus cries out all the louder. And gets Jesus' attention. Check this out in Mark 10. It says this. Jesus stopped and said, call him. So they called the blind man. Cheer up on your feet. He's calling you. Throwing his robe aside. That's important. Throwing his robe aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. Check this part out. What do you want me to do for you? Ask Jesus. Imagine if Jesus was to ask you that question today, what would you say? What do you want me to do for you? Do you want me to give you just some loose change in my pocket? What do you really want? What does your soul really want? What are you really looking for in this life? Bartimaeus, confronted by this question from Jesus, replies with the most purest thing that he could think of. I, I just want to see. I want to see, Jesus. I want to see. Go, Jesus said. Your faith has healed you. Immediately. Instantly, immediately. I like these words. Immediately, he received his sight and followed Jesus along the road. 
So here's a story about Jesus meeting the need of a beggar. And it says that he throws off his robe and he jumps to his feet. Now, why is that significant? Why is that important? See, in that culture, Jewish people, when they gave to the poor, they didn't want to give to a scam artist. So in order to figure out who they were actually giving to, they would certify poor people. And they would put a robe on them so they would be known as certified poor. So instead of caring for the poor, they labeled the poor because they thought it made God love them even more. So when Jesus calls this man, when Jesus calls Bartimaeus, it says he put his robe off. He took his robe and threw it to the side because it's kind of like when Jesus calls our name, when Jesus calls us close to us, the insecurities and the labels that the world puts on you, oh, you just got to throw them off. You just got to throw them off. But here's the best part of the story, too. This dude's blind. He can't see what's in front of him. But he walks to Jesus based on Jesus calling him near. Friends, you may not always understand what Jesus is doing, but when he nudges you, when he calls you, even when you can't see everything that's happening, just walk towards him. Because when you walk towards him, he's not going to give you the loose change like the world is trying to give you. He's going to ask you the question, what do you really want? And he's faithful to give it to you. If you're Peter and John, this story will pop in your head. When you're, when you're standing at the gate called Beautiful looking at this crippled man, you would think of this story when God healed Bartimaeus. Because if God did it to Bartimaeus, God will be faithful to do it again to this man. Peter began to think if, if, if God did it once, He'll do it again. And you may be in here today, and you're looking around your life situations, and you're thinking to yourself, is my marriage ever going to walk again? Is my family ever going to get right? Am I going to be able to make it in this job, or will I ever live out my dreams again? Will I ever get out this debt? And I just want you to know something with some faith today. If Jesus healed the beggar before, he'll do it again. If Jesus has fixed marriages before, guess what? Your marriage isn't too far gone. If Jesus has helped families before, he can do it again and help yours. If he got people out of debt before, he'll get you in financial freedom as well. If Jesus did it once, he's faithful to do it again. Because great is his faithfulness, friends. If he did it once, he'll do it again. And our confidence does not come from the things around us, but our confidence should be connected to a God that is bigger and greater and stronger than the temporary problems of this world. Colossians 3 says this, Since then you have been raised with Christ. Set your hearts on things above, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Friends, even if everything around you looks like it's not going the way you want it, set your heart and mind on Christ, and he'll take your set, setbacks and use that for your biggest setups in life to move you forward. See, the Holy Spirit will remind you of who you are in Jesus. The Holy Spirit will remind you that if God has done it before, he's faithful to do it again. Point one, responding to the nudge will take an ordinary day and make it extraordinary. Point two, responding to the nudge will give you confidence that God will do it again. And my third and my final point today is this. Responding to the nudge will allow you to see daily miracles. Responding to the nudge will allow you to see daily miracles. See, it was just an ordinary day. It was just a one day. But maybe it's just me. Maybe I'm the only one. I'm a little crazy sometimes. Maybe it's just me. But sometimes I wake up, and when I wake up, this day doesn't feel like it's my day. Has anyone ever been there? Or have you ever been to work, and you look around, and you think to yourself, why the heck am I here right now? Because sometimes your day doesn't feel like it's the one day, right? 
or the good day. Life happens, and sometimes it can feel overwhelming. And Pastor Jacob, you're telling me I can experience God every day? Yeah, I am. But not only that, I'm telling you that you can see miracles every day in your life. And the reason, one of the reasons why I know this is because the Bible declares the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in us. That same Holy Spirit that had resurrection power to lift Jesus out of the grave three days after his death. That same spirit lives in us. And if we have the spirit of resurrection in our lives, God can take the dead things in our lives. God can take the broken things in our lives and bring life back to it. Oh, come on now. Come on. I know this because God can take an ordinary day and make it extraordinary. I know this because if God did it once, he can do it again. See, the definition of a miracle is this. The definition of a miracle is something supernatural happening in a natural environment. Something supernatural happening in a natural environment. Peter and John were walking up to the temple. They're doing their natural thing, their normal thing. And as they walk up to the temple, they perform one of the most famous miracles in the New Testament church. But in my opinion, the miracle was not the crippled man learning to walk again. That was not the miracle that Acts 3 talks about. That was, that was what happened after the miracle. Because if a miracle is something supernatural happening in a natural environment, what's one of the most supernatural things that can happen in a natural environment? In our world today especially, one of the most supernatural things that can happen is exactly what Peter and John did. When they saw someone in need, they didn't walk past them. They loved them like Jesus would love them. The miracle was that they saw this man like Jesus saw them. They saw this man not for who he was sitting at this gate every day. They saw this man for who he could be, the purpose that God had for him. And friends, I'm going to tell you this today. We may be looking for the miraculous. We may be looking for signs and wonders. But God is just saying to you today, I put people in front of you that you're supposed to love on, you're supposed to care for. I've given you a family that you're supposed to give your all for. Don't go looking for the miraculous if you're not taking care of the everyday. Because one of the most supernatural things that we can do is loving someone who's hard to love back. Forgiving someone who hasn't even confessed to their sins. Honoring someone who you want to slap in the face. That's real supernatural. Don't gossip about that coworker. Don't complain about that boss. Don't hold on to bitterness against your spouse, but instead encourage someone. Be the person that holds the door open for someone. And then when two or three more extra people walk by, don't complain about it. You know what I'm talking about. See, a lot of times, life, life can kind of feel like when you're walking through the mall. And when you're walking through the mall, the mall is filled with the kiosk people. And the kiosk people, they make life uncomfortable. And if you're a kiosk person in here, I want to let you know you make life uncomfortable. <laughs> They're always trying to sell their arrangements of cell phone covers. We don't want them. They're doing the crazy eyebrow thing. Like, wow, that looks like that hurts. You're, eye, you're cutting someone's eyebrow with floss. I don't know what's happening. <laughs> see, but for me, when I'm in a mall and I see the kiosk people, and I know they're going to ask me if I want something, you want to know what I do? Maybe I'm the only one that does this. I pull out my phone and act like I'm, like, very, like, intensely doing something on my phone. And when I'm walking past them, I act like I can't hear them because I'm on my phone. Like, hey, what you saying? But the truth is, I'm doing nothing on my phone. I'm not, I'm not doing anything. But isn't that such a great picture of life? God has put people all around us who need what we have. But instead of meeting the needs of the people around us, we get so caught up in self-centered things that we miss the people all around us. Oh, come on. 
Come on. Sometimes we get so focused on our own thing that we miss that our coworker just needs someone to encourage them and love them because we got the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead. And when we bring that spirit to work, when we bring that spirit to our schools, to our families, to the communities, to the environments that God has placed you in, and when you let that thing breathe and touch people all around you, it will begin to change the environment all around you. Instead of waking up on Monday dreading that you have to go to work, it's an opportunity to spread the love of God. Instead of waiting for the weekend, you, you're excited through the week because God's going to use you on your normal day, on your ordinary day, on your one day. Taking them by the right hand, he helped them up. Instantly, the man's feet and ankles became strong. Peter grabbed him by the right hand. The man spent his whole life begging from one place to the next. Then the Bible says he grabbed him by the right hand. The right hand represented the hand of blessing in that culture. Peter grabbed him by the right hand, symbolizing that God is ready to bless you and lift you back up on your feet. Friends, who are we grabbing by the right hand? Who are we lifting up and reminding them, come on, reminding them that God is not done with you yet. I got, I just got one more thing I got to say. It ain't on my notes. I just got to say this. If you're going to go your whole life looking how to build your own life and your own self and just do you boo-boo kind of life, you will always be missing and wanting more because Jesus demonstrated that this life is not about how much we can gain, but this life is about how much we can give to the people around us. Jesus led the example. He said, I'm going to give it all for people who don't even appreciate me. See, if we keep going through life trying to figure out how much we can gain, how much we can get, how we can build our own name and our own things, you will always be searching and looking for something. But when you go through your everyday life, just asking a question, saying a little prayer, God, who can I give to today? Who who can I love on today? Who can I bless today? Who can I encourage today? Man, friends, you will begin to change the perspective of your life, and your life will feel more fulfilled when you give rather than when you receive. Who are we blessing? Who are we loving? If this gospel story is everything that we think it is, oh, it should motivate us to love this world to no ends. Are we going to let the news take Speak the loudest. Are we going to let cultural problems speak the loudest? Are we going to let the truth, the truth that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall never perish but have everlasting life. Are we going to let that truth be the thing that we spread every day? He jumped to his feet and began to walk. Then he went with them into the temple courts, walking and jumping and praising God. I like this part right here. Check this part out. When all the people saw him walking and praising God, they recognized him as the same man who used to sit begging at the temple gate called Beautiful. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. See, not only did Peter and John change this man's life, but they changed the lives of everyone around him. When we respond to the nudge, miracles can happen. Here's one good news, one good truth about this gospel. Everyone gets to play. Everyone has the Holy Spirit in them, and God will use you. Just respond to the nudge. Bow your heads with me. Let's pray. God. thank you that you speak to us. God, we thank you that you're alive and active. God, we thank you that you call us by name. So Holy Spirit, we come to you right now saying we need to hear you clearly. We want to respond to your nudge. We want to live lives courageous. 
just like Peter, who wasn't the bravest person, he wasn't the most courageous person, but he was obedient. God, may we be able to overcome our fears and just be obedient to you. I feel like there's some people in here, when I talked about, when I talked about you feel like you don't know what's going to happen with your family, if God can fix your marriage. I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, he did it once, he'll do it again. I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, trust in him. He has a plan for your family. I also feel like there's some people in here who feel inadequate to be used by God. It's like they don't have all the answers. They, they haven't read the Bible all the way. They don't know. And I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, he wants to use you. He said, just make yourself available. I also feel like, yep, there's some people who are having a hard time being confident in God. How could I be confident in a God that I don't necessarily see him? Where is he? I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, just put your trust in me. Put your hope in me. And watch what I will do for your life. You may be in here today and you never made a decision to trust Jesus with your life. You never made a decision to follow Jesus. And you're like, Pastor Jacobs, that's a good message. I want to follow that Jesus you talked about. I'm going to pray your prayer. And I'm not going to call you out or embarrass you, have you come up front, nothing like that. Right where you are, you can say this prayer with me and ask Jesus to come into your life. Maybe you've said that prayer before, but life kind of got in the way. And you're saying, I want to make that decision again. I want to follow Jesus again. You can, you can repeat this prayer with me right where you are. Just say, just say right where you are, say, Jesus, forgive me for my mistake. I receive your love. I receive your grace. Today I follow you. Today I trust in you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for listening to this week's message. We hope you enjoyed it. Don't hesitate to write us your story at amen at vineyardchurch.com. And we'll see you next week.